Hi everybody and welcome to another piano video here at Marion Pianos. My name is Stu Harrison and today's video we are comparing a Friedland 123 with a Schimmel 123. That's right, we've basically got the same piano being built in Germany as well as China and we are going to compare exactly what differences we are seeing in one versus the other. What are you really going to get uh, given the $20,000 spread between those two instruments? So let's see if you can tell the difference. Certainly there are some and it's an interesting exploration nonetheless. Uh, if it's the first time to the channel, we would really appreciate it if you subscribe, become part of our community. We really enjoy hearing from people all over the world, what they're doing with pianos, their whole piano journey, uh, and we love participating in the comments. So without any further ado, let's get started with this uh, comparison between the Friedland 123 and the Schimmel 123. So let's begin with the Friedlin 123. Friedlin is a line that is uh, designed and distributed uh, and really owned by Schimmel. Uh, Schimmel is of course now owned by Pearl River. They were uh, one of the Chinese companies who came in and uh, kind of bought Schimmel and has really injected the cash into the company, but has left the German operation more or less to operate the way that it always has been. And so, uh, I, you know, it seems like the outcome of that merger uh, has been an incredibly positive one for both Pearl River as well as Schimmel. And so people who have always loved the Schimmel pianos can continue to love the Schimmel pianos. There really, uh, at this point, does not seem to be any kind of a great cost cutting going on. Uh, this was uh, kind of preserved in a very similar way to what Yamaha did with Bösendorfer, basically buy the asset, keep it operating, um, more or less the same way that it always had. Uh, so uh, the whole uh, kind of the idea of today's video is to look at an instrument that is exactly the same design, uh, scale design and size that is, as a German counterpart because that doesn't happen very often and we're going to see what the differences are between the two pianos because we've got one that's around a $10,000 instrument and then another one that's more like around a $30,000 instrument um, but uh, they both are built off exactly the same scale and so what are the differences that you are getting from one to the other um, and having played both for quite some time they're lovely instruments uh, and uh, even for people who are coming into this with a budget of eight, nine, ten thousand dollars and thinking that perhaps their only alternative really was to be looking at a Choir Yamaha, the Friedland 121, Friedland 123, they're really uh, a compelling choice to, uh, to look at. It's a different tone, it's a different touch than what you get from the Japanese. And uh, now that I've really been under the hood, looked at the bridging system, looked at the way that they've strung it, the way they've constructed it, uh, I mean, certainly there are differences with the German stuff, but done a nice job with this line. This has honestly got to be one of the absolute best products uh, that's coming out of any kind of a Chinese factory uh, on the planet right now. Um, and again, and completely uh, designed by Schimmel. So, uh, So it's a very uh, lush, it's a very warm sound, quite a bit warmer than what you'd expect out of really an Asian piano or certainly comparing it to the Japanese Yamaha or the Kawai, which are uh, far more upfront with the tone. 
Um, so what are we hearing here? Well, uh, definitely we're getting great bass response and there's a nice uh, flow and transition between all the different ranges of the piano and that's a sign of a great scale design. The layout of the strings and the bridges and how it uh, kind of links all these different uh, areas together. Virtually no detectable break on the instrument. A nice quick action is very, very effortless to play, uh, which is also good. And I'm getting some nice dynamic, or sorry, some tonal dynamicism, meaning uh, as I play from dark uh, to bright, there's much more of a shift in the tone uh, than what I would normally get out of a German upright piano, certainly out of the Schimmel, where it's extremely clear right from the very lowest dynamic ranges, uh, clear and lots of uh, treble, uh, lots of upper harmonics uh, coming off, whereas you have to sort of dig for them a little bit more. So some people might see that as a good thing, some people might see that as a negative. That's, of course, the personal nature of finding an instrument you love to play. Uh, but as we move over to the Schimmel, um, here are the things that I think we need to uh, kind of pay attention to. The power of the instrument, uh, the sustain, uh, the attack, and the clarity. These are all things that tend to improve when you go from an instrument like this to an instrument where its cousin is going to have improvements with soundboard, uh, hammers, quality of the strings, and just overall uh, build quality and prep. So in terms of power, No issue with the lower frequencies and the lower mid frequencies. Where I'm, uh, where I'm, I'm sure anticipating where I'm going to hear more power is in some of those higher frequencies. Surprisingly very low distortion really when you punch some of those trichords up there where sometimes you'd expect it to break up and become a little bit meowy. Uh, I don't know what word is, but you, you kind of like a kind of thing. There's a little bit, but it's very light and honestly quite a bit less than what I would expect out of other instruments in this price range. The regulation is not what you would normally get out of a uh, the 30,000 German, which is just so finessed. Certainly, if you were to spend five to ten hours regulating this with a concert technician, you could really get this up to a very high level. As I mentioned in another video where I was looking at these Friedelands, this feels kind of like a playing a Yamaha U3 right now. This is very, very similar touch, key dip, uh, overall response, uh, super familiar. Um, and then clarity in the top end. Pretty good. Certainly there's less bloom, or in fact, it's hard for me to detect much bloom uh, at all on this instrument. 
I, again, I should mention, not unusual for this price range, but I have a feeling that's something we're gonna get when we get over to the shimmel, this uh, kind of this effortless kind of, uh, even at a low dynamic uh, input, especially in this top range. But certainly once activated, this treble is really singing quite nicely. But a bit less color and a bit less shimmer. Um, now even though it's the same scale design as the Shimmel 123, the bridging system is not the same. We've got a solid bridge here, um, which means that you're gonna get a little bit less uh, blending going on um, you know, throughout the range. Uh, and there's also a chance that you're going to experience a bit more energy loss through the bridge. But man, they've strung that piano well, and that's a nice scale. That's a nice... Getting some good sustain up there. So anyway, lots to like in this, in this 123. Um, but let's hop over to the Schimmel 123 and find out exactly what an extra 20,000 bucks is going to get you if you've got the budget to spend that. If not, then you stop right here and you're left with a very satisfying musical instrument. We'll be back in just a second. So now we come to the Schimmel. Uh, and this is the proper Schimmel, the one made in Germany, uh, also the model 123. And so we can start to hear a few differences, I think, right away. Power, clarity, attack. Um, all three of those things are just immediately more pronounced on the instrument. Uh, definitely more power, and that power comes from the fact that it is a better piece of wood on that spruce, so that means there's less energy needed to activate the soundboard. The less moisture, uh, the drier the wood, I guess those are the two, two of the same things, uh, the more dense the wood, all of those things mean that energy just can uh, uh, kind of activate and, and reside within that, that membrane um, for longer periods of time and with less energy. So better sustain and better power. And you notice that right away. Uh, second, the um, attack for sure. And, and this is something that I've always noticed about Schimmel pianos, uh, even more so than say a Bechstein uh, or another uh, kind of a really, really well-made uh, German piano is that the Schimmel tends to have this very bright, kind of immediate, pronounced attack. Grotrian might be the, the, the other one that uh, reminds me of this more than anything else. And that's coming from a few different uh, factors. Schimmel puts a slightly heavier hammer on their uprights than other similarly sized uprights. So there's just more mass hitting the string. That's one of the reasons why we get that beautiful attack um, off there. And by the way, that's, that's a very uh, kind of personal choice. Some people don't like the really uh, sort of bright, very upfront attack. Uh, but for those that do, they'll love the Schimmel. Uh, so that's coming from a slightly heavier hammer, um, but 
uh, hitting a string harder, unless that string is perfectly positioned within uh, the piano. So when you've got your trichords up here with three, you know, three strings per note, um, if the termination points aren't exact, if those, if those uh, strings um, aren't perfect in every way they can be, the harder you hit those, the more it distorts, the more you actually get a lot of unwanted interference between the strings and harmonics, and it just creates this kind of ugly sound. So it's an uh, it's unusual tone when you can really uh, drill in, dr you know, dig in deeply uh, to a note, especially in this mid to upper mid uh, treble, and you hear that clear bell tone and it really doesn't break up. That's just a wonderful uh, sign. It's really a, a telltale test of whether the, an upright's been built really well or not. You know, and so all of these things that I'm mentioning are things that uh, there may be characteristics or aspects of that which you still hear on the Friedland, um, but the scale design on its own just simply doesn't contribute anything uh, to the difference in these factors that we are uh, listing off. And so we've got power, we've got sustain, uh, we've got this uh, lovely attack, and then we've got this extreme level of clarity. And the clarity is also coming from uh, just really uh, perfect prep at the factory, but it's also coming from somewhere else. It's, uh, there is uh, a, a high level of uh, harmonic color throughout the instrument. And one of the things that uh, just fascinates me about Schimmel generally is how innovative they've been with their bridges. And so string players know how critical bridges are. You'll have violinists and cellists who will spend tens of thousands of dollars on a bridge because of the effect it has on the overall instrument. And I know that there will be a lot of competing views on, on you know, whether a great bridge or a, a, an okay bridge contributes 2% or 20%. And I mean, it's, this is a, I don't wanna open up a can of worms here, but I do know that people pay a lot of money for a great bridge on a string instrument. That, that's a fact. And, uh, but when it comes to pianos, the bridges are really something that's not part of the discussion at all as a buyer. I mean, we kind of know they're there. I mean, some players know they're there. Some people, I think just as long as the piano does what it wants them to, they're not that interested in digging under the hood. But the bridge plays a really big part. And it's the same part that it plays on a piano as it does on a string instrument. It's the little highway that transmits all of the uh, frequency information, harmonic information, and the energy from the string uh, onto whatever uh, the resonating surface is. And so Schimmel uh, does some really uh, interesting things uh, in terms of um, uh, horizontally laminated bridge caps. That's something I think is totally unique uh, to Schimmel. And it kind of creates a very different, it's a little bit difficult to describe. I'm getting into like trying to talk about wine here. It's, it's, you start inventing your own vocabulary. Uh, but it does uh, change the immediate harmonic of, at the point of the attack. And I'm not sure how to describe it. I just know that it sounds a little bit different on Schimmel's uh, than it does on other instruments. It's kind of interesting. I like when pianos surprise me in a good way uh, like that. Uh, and then that also continues all the way down into the bass. And then another factor that high-end pianos get, and again, this is not something that really gets articulated or talked about a lot, because you're seldom comparing instruments in this price range with the Friedland, but the quality of the bass string is uh, a, a very dynamic uh, factor in, in piano building. And it's not the easiest thing to wind a bass string, to create a bass string that's very clear, lots of energy, there's no tubbiness to it. Uh, and what usually happens uh, is the very best bass strings and the very best bass string makers, because a lot of the times this is done by hand, uh, wind up on the very best, most expensive pianos. And the ones that are okay kind of filter down into the lower ranks of the instruments. And it's not cheap uh, to buy even just a single bass string. You could pay easily $40, $50 uh, uh, for one of the smaller ones and upwards of $100 per string. Um, if you're a customer purchasing one of these as a replacement. Uh, when you think about 88 keys and the fact that most instruments have like 230, 240 strings, and about a third of those are bass strings, it's like, 
that gets up there. That's a big part of the price that not a lot of people think about. So um, there you have it. There are the, this is what you get when you basically triple your budget, um, even though you're dealing with exactly the same design, the scale design of the instrument, the size of the instrument, but why all of a sudden you have three times the budget? Well, yes, I know the German labor factors into that, but let's just remember, we've got better spruce on the soundboard that's giving you uh, better uh, power and it's giving you a better sustain. We've got a more advanced bridging system which is going to give you a more colorful sound. Again, less energy needed to get all of that color through. You've got slightly heavier hammers and higher quality hammers. You've got precision in terms of how the strings have been strung uh, and and just uh, you know how um, the, the smaller tolerances that they're doing overall prep for and then better bass strings. All of those things you are going to get um, whether you're comparing a mid-range uh, Schimmel like the Friedelin to something like this, the, the 123, or even in another company that does uh, the kind of the cross-branding really well with Beckstein. If you're looking at their Hoffman series, um, uh, where that's done all in the Czech, but you've got kind of similar uh, German uh, piano scales uh, that are done in Germany, you start to, again, still see some of those differences. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed that comparison, uh, found it interesting, learned a little bit more about some upright pianos and piano building in general, and certainly we hope that you will be back for other videos here at Miriam Pianos. Please subscribe, please comment. We love growing our community and hearing from new people all the time. Thanks so much, my name is Stu Harrison, and we'll see you again soon. Sun is right.